Hello, Samelo. Hi, 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 hi. Long time. Are you good? I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Great to see you. Great to see you too. So how is the joke? Actually, I'm in, 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 in Senegal. I have traveled in Dakar for the atelier from de la Pensée. Okay, okay. And, okay. and just after that, I stay a few months before I go back to Tuduk because I took a sabbatical. Okay, okay, okay. And how is the Dakar? No, Dakar is fine. Dakar is Great. fine. Great. Hi, Prof. Hi, hi. How are you, Roland? I'm great. I'm doing well. <laughs> and you? No, I'm fine. I'm fine. Great to see yeah, you. I was worried. <laughs> My pleasure, Prof. You. I was worried that I'm not getting the audio, but uh, thank God I, you I am connected this time. Sure, 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 sure. No, it's when great. are we due to start? Welcome. We thank want you, to wait for Prof. Achille Mbembe to come. Then we will start. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and how will you organize the conversation? Um, in fact, what is going to happen is I will do the, the brief summary of the project, introduce Achille, he gives a presentation for maximum 45 minutes. Okay. And then I will hand over to Dr. Wongani Mudunga mm -hmm. from uh, <clears throat> the Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Study to introduce the discussions. Mm -hmm. and okay. I think we will be able to give you maybe about 10 minutes each. Mm -hmm. uh, 10 minutes, yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, then we open up. So it will mean uh, if we give you 10 minutes each and uh, four of you are around, it will be 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, then we'll be left with 30 minutes for discussion. Okay, so the whole conversation is two hours? Two hours. That's two hours. Okay, great. Okay. Sure. Great. Good, very good. Uh, Doug Mudunga, how are you? I'm doing good. I mean, it's it's good to see you. It's how good. is how is Johannesburg? Uh, not as uh, cold as it has been in the past. Uh, few days it's much yeah. better today yeah I mean, it has been cold and raining uh, yeah okay yeah oh. yes yeah. 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 yesterday it was warmer today is a bit colder but not the serious cold okay yesterday it was really sunny well, it uh, been raining here and causing havoc i mean especially in Washington. yeah 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 i saw i saw that yeah uh, I hope Prof. Um, Achille will join us soon. Yeah, I'm sure. Not, he has not joined yet. Yeah.
I see you are in. Are you back at Jaya's? I'm right next door. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I got back last night. Oh, you, you got back last night. I mean, I was yeah. uh, I was I was worried for a second. I don't know. <laughs> I no, you. everything went well. Everything no. went well. Oh, yeah. great. Oh, no. How are you, we'll how talk. Hi, how are you? <laughs> yeah. Great to see you. I was hoping you'd be here when we have this event. I was, I was <laughs> counting on you being in I, I've been trying to get him to come here. I mean, this guy just... I'm, I'm, I'm on my way to that place. <laughs> yeah, make sure, make sure you come before I leave, though. Yeah, yeah, no, I will do that. <laughs> okay, you have a lot of witnesses, so... <laughs> yeah. I, I've even bought his, uh, his ticket. He just doesn't want to, want to try his work. <laughs> it's waiting for you. Great. No, I will. I will come. I will make sure I'm there. Maybe you move the event to Pretoria. He will come. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think Prof prefers Pretoria to Joburg. If you have to transfer to Pretoria, he will come. I will. I will drive him there. I will drive him there myself if I need to. I'll. I'll, I'll hire a car and drive him there myself. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just a quick uh, a question to uh, colleagues at Jazz. Uh, when when do the fellowships open? Because everything is closed now. The applications yeah. for the fellowships. We'll advertise pretty soon uh, for the first half of the year. Uh, I think uh, what is now? I mean, we should in the next two weeks or so. Okay. Uh, cooking up for, for next uh, for next year. Yeah. I've been at jazz a couple of times uh, when I was postdoc at UJ. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I'm back in Cameroon now. Uh, okay. I was at Center for uh, Educational Rights and Transformation with um, Prof. Uh, Salim. Oh, Salim, Salim, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So I would love to come back sometimes. Yeah. No, it is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let me see. Uh, Professor Mkwena is here. Tonipa, welcome. Hello. Um, hey. I should have. Hi. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, was, I was worried about load shedding. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, I have you in South Africa. You have to mitigate against it. So I'm 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 sitting in a shopping mall. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was so worried about load shedding. Uh, uh, Samuel, uh, see, uh, Prof. Member is here. So. Hey, hi, hi, Prof. Hi. Hi, Samuel. How are you? Yeah, hey, great to see you. <laughs> oh, lovely to see you. How are you? Hey, I'm fine. I'm fine. And uh, how is Johans? Are you in Johannesburg? Uh, yeah, you look, you look fabulous. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I love your glasses. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, okay. No, great that you have managed to join us. Oh, sure, sure. No, no, no. But thanks so much, Sabelo. Thanks. Yes, yes, yes. Um, 
I think, Bongani, uh, we can begin. Yeah. Um, a greetings to all and, uh, and a welcome. Uh, my name is Savelo Jainlo Vukacheni. I'm uh, a professor here and the chair in epistemologies of the Global South here at the University of Pyroid. And it is my great pleasure and indeed honor to welcome you all to this first seminar in a series of monthly seminars on the theme of the changing, uh, <clears throat> the changing African idea of Africa and the future of African studies. Uh, it is a, a collaborative project that my chair <clears throat> at the University of Bayreuth and the Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Study at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa, conceived at the beginning. Some of the information that you used to our chapter, our book chapter. Yeah. This uh, is someone who wrote a paper that is sent to me to review. Oh. Uh, but I knew that he hello, wrote that paper. Hello, because hello, he... hello. <laughs> yes. Um, I was saying this is a collaborative uh, initiative between uh, my chair here at the University of Bayreuth and the, the Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Study at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. Uh, and uh, we planned it last year, but to begin this month in April. It is also part of our project here at the University of Bayreuth, the Africa Multiple Cluster of Excellence, whose mandate is to, wow. to advance the agenda of reconfiguring African studies. And as such, the seminars are part also of our regular uh, knowledge lab events, which are organized around questions of uh, methodology, theory, and the reflexive African studies. In our conceptualization of this type of event, we're informed by the idea of rethinking Africa itself as an idea, as a concept, as a place, as a project, and its many iterations at a time of the insurgent and resurgent decolonization of the 21st century. And we thought that would be a necessary departure point in the agenda of reconfiguring African studies. And as we were conceiving it, we also thought of no other person to start us off other than Professor Achil Mbembe, a research professor at the University of uh, Avit Vatasrand, based at the Vets Institute for Social and Economic uh, <clears throat> Research in South Africa. And uh, I think uh, I need not to say too much about that. Chilbembe is well known. <laughs> uh, but let me say that he has written extensively on Africa and he is well known for his incisive and original ideas on various aspects of African studies, questions of power, questions of knowledge, questions of violence, decolonization, and the many other pertinent and the topical subjects. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, Today, we are delighted to have him among us, and uh, he is going to be really delivering the first in a series of these seminars. Uh, but and, uh, his topic for today is Africa in theory. But before I call him to deliver his lecture, I must also uh, speak about <clears throat> the way we have organized this event. The format is that uh, Prof. Achil Bembe, in fact, the whole event is two hours. Uh, and uh, Prof. Achil Mbembe will give him up to 45 minutes maximum. And uh, then he, we will have um, uh, the second part of uh, the event, which is the, the, the aspect of the discussions. And I think there are four of them and they will give them each maybe 10 minutes. But uh, Dr. Bongani Ngolunga will introduce them. And uh, then we'll have maybe 30 minutes of question and answer. Uh, with these few remarks, I'm really delighted to call Professor Achil Mbembe to deliver his lecture. Achil, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, uh, I would like to, to start by um, expressing my, my sincere uh, gratitude to, to Sabelo uh, and Bongani um, for, for his kind uh, invitation. I would also like to to use this opportunity to 
to recognize publicly the, uh, the depth and uh, significance of uh, the work he has been uh, doing uh, over many, many years. Uh, it is a, a foundational work of which we have all, uh, in any case, I have, have learned uh, a lot. The, um, the panel of uh, scholars he has uh, assembled for uh, tonight's conversation is, is intimidating uh, to say the, the least. Um, these are all uh, friends and, and colleagues I have uh, learned a lot from. And in some instances, uh, uh, in fact, uh, I have been involved with in the ongoing project of, of curating our common uh, intellectual endeavor, I think in particular of, uh, about Felwin. I, I thought, uh, Sabelo, uh, that the, the best way to, to address tonight's uh, topic was to, to draw maybe from, from my own little experience and, and to share um, with uh, our audience a few uh, vignettes uh, from a work which uh, now totals a dozen of single authored books um, translated in more than uh, 15 uh, uh, languages and which has um, um, attracted um, a fairly broad scope of, of critical commentary uh, uh, in, in various countries and, uh, and mul multiple disciplines. Uh, choosing to do this, uh, 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 as you know, I, I'm not uh, trying to make my own publicity, but, but I, I thought, uh, doing this would, would give a, a kind of um, uh, uh, liveliness to the discussion I hope we'll have tonight. And, and uh, I just hope uh, many will, uh, let's say, um, forgive me for, for, for doing that. In uh, the process, uh, objectively, I think it can no longer be my work defined as uh, pertaining to the field of African studies stricto sensu. Uh, le let me say that uh, right from, from the beginning. Let me say that because uh, what is Africa anyway? Let me just put it, put that question uh, in this provocative form. What is Africa anyway? According to uh, Valentin Mudimbe, Africa is, uh, I quote him, an invention, which means that. Uh, uh, Africa only exists if we follow Mudimbe as a product of something he calls the colonial library. Now, what Mudimbe calls the colonial library is something much more complex than many I think have been led to believe. He uses the term, the colonial library, in particular, in his uh, famous work of 19, I think 88, The Invention of Africa, which by the way was written uh, in English. It has just been translated in French uh, by uh, our colleague Mamadou Diouf, and uh, it came out uh, last year, finally, uh, to uh, some 
some uh, renewed acclaim uh, for uh, those of our colleagues who, who only read French. So he used that concept of the colonial library in the invention of Africa. Early on in an earlier volume, which this time has not yet, as far as I know, been translated into English, which is called L'odeur du père, meaning the father's smell. Mudimbe um, argues in a not so dissimilar context that the colonial library, although he doesn't give it that name yet, is itself a co-invention. A co-invention in the sense that uh, the uh, sum of discourses of knowledges of fables and fantasies that have come to be known under the sign of Africa, that compilation, concatenation of facts and fictions was not simply produced, to put it simply, by colonial knowledge. That in fact, it was produced, to put it simply once again, by them and by us. And that this is the reason why it is, at least in his mind, extremely difficult to separate one from the other. That somewhat there is a kind of inseparability if one looks into the genesis of the colonial library, an inseparability or um, a, a distinct capacity to apportion what is theirs and what is ours. Of course, this is a major point he's making, which goes at the heart of what could indeed be a, a different way of thinking what is known today as decolonization of knowledge. If we follow Mudimbe, then we are forced to ask ourselves whether any project of decolonization does not somewhat automatically entail a certain amount of self-decolonization. You see the, the kind of paradoxical nature of Mudimbe's argument and um, the complexity he wants to bring into the question of who is the author of what form of knowledge. So uh, that is his manner of asking the question, what is Africa anyway? But it seems to me, and that's the second point I would like to put on the table. It seems to me that uh, from Mudimbe's um, speculations, we can infer that for him, Africa must remain an open question. That for Africa to be generative as a concept, it has to remain an open-ended question. 
I buy into that, that idea. Because, um, and this is part of what I have in any case tried to show in my own, own work, what strikes me is the extent to which the continent, however we want to define it, is in fact caught in an enormous work of reassemblage. Reassemblage of uh, one form or, or the other. A reassemblage whose costs are very high. A reassemblage that hasn't started with colonialism. Thus, the uh, importance of te the temporal rescaling that any attempt at writing Africa in theory imposes upon us because our history didn't start in 1884. It started long before 1884. Uh, the, the death, the profundity of our archive has to be taken into account in any attempt at writing our continent into theory. What is called and known in the French language as the longer durée, the deep history of Africa. And that deep history, so far as I know, has hardly been indeed taken into account as a foundational pillar for theorizing the continent. In spite of the existence of uh, complex knowledge about the history of what is known as pre-colonial Africa. So, if you want, I'm arguing for a return to Africa's deep history as the ground, the um, ground zero, if you want, of our effort at theorizing. So that's the first point. Mudimbe doesn't make that point. He's certainly aware of it. He's very much, um, he works a lot with anthropologists, especially uh, structural anthropology of the, uh, the levi Straussian kind of Marxist anthropology too, uh, which were the two key uh, discourses that were somewhat prevalent at the time he was writing. Uh, Foucault, of course, being uh, uh, in the background, but these were his, two key interlocutors. Historians were not. I'm suggesting that we bring back historians of the long jury into uh, this interdisciplinary conversation. And if we do that, then it will become somewhat easier, uh, in any case, I presume, to put forward, let's say, um, a picture of the continent of Africa that um, highlights the many ways in which over this long history, it has attempted, it has been in a process of synthesizing itself, 
in the work of synthesizing itself, of doing this most of the times in the mode of disjunction and in the mode of redistribution of differences. Whether we deal with political systems, political ideas, religious ideas, cultural ideas, modes of inhabiting space, modes of negotiating the dialectics between mobility, circulation, and space, we will see suddenly how in fact the archive we are dealing with becomes ever rich, ever complex, ever ambivalent, ever paradoxical. We'll see uh, also how in fact Using this deep archive, we can enrich broader discussions, including on the times we live in and the kinds of challenges our world is facing today. Chief among which is the very question of life futures and of the habitability of the earth as such. We'll then be able to contribute to, for instance, ongoing discussions in the field of anthropology, for ex example, around the so-called ontological term. We'll see how just like in Amazonia and other parts of the world, the famous distinction between nature and culture is not something that has been crucial to our historical existence. We'll be able to see how the kind of return to animism, which is characteristic of the technological moment we live in, how in fact Africa helps us to attend to these issues without the kind of trauma Western, contemporary Western theory uh, goes through when dealing with this. In any case, huge windows of possibility, a huge new ima theoretical imagination will be open to us and will allow us to drive the search for uh, paradigms that might help us to account for the world, for the earth as it goes now and here. That's in any case, the hypothesis. So, it's possible maybe not to define Africa as such, but to interpret it following and extending Mudimbe's intuitions uh, in a way that then takes us beyond the, uh, for me, uh, dilemma of pessimism or optimism, which is not really an intellectual debate, it's uh, an ideological debate. In any case, we'll be able to see the extent to which something fertile might spring from this immense tilled field of matter and things, something capable of opening onto uh, an infinite, into an extensive, into a heterogeneous universe, uh, a wide open universe of multiplicities and pluralities. That's exactly the point I want to highlight, this question of multiplicity and pluralities. And if you want me to use other images, 
Africa then becomes a body in motion, which it has always been in any case. A body in motion meaning a body never in its place, whose center moves everywhere. This uh, body moving in the enormous machine of the world. So that's the first set of comments I wanted to, to share with you. And uh, I wanted to do that starting from the uh, little amount of work I have uh, tried to, to do. Now, let me uh, share another uh, set of comments, this time having to do with what seems to me to be a very important moment in our global intellectual life today. And this has to do with what seems to me to be a redrawing of the global intellectual map. A redrawing of the global intellectual map in the sense that more than ever before, I would say in particular since the last quarter of the 20th century, we have witnessed a worldwide dissemination of thought which didn't exist before that period of time. I contend that this has happened in particular uh, during the last quarter of the 20th century, worldwide dissemination of thought, itself uh, buttressed by uh, a worldwide circulation and translation of texts, a uh, highly productive uh, invention and reappropriation of concepts and the uh, denationalization of the great academic debates. Now, of course, we can ask ourselves whether what are called the denationalization of the great academic debates, especially in the humanities and in the social sciences, whether it has brought a truly global perspective to conventional Western theory and criticism. I think this is a question that uh, has to be taken seriously. And because denationalization has not necessarily resulted in um, the uh, entry into a truly, what I call a truly global perspective on, uh, on theory, then the question of the decolonization of knowledge remains. And that's the second move I, I'm trying to make. First, inscription in the long jury. Second, the legitimacy of the decolonization project. The question of what does it mean? Of course, remaining open and Sabelo and a number of others have intervened brilliantly into that discussion. My way of partaking into that debate has been somewhat different in the sense that what I have taken as my starting point has been the simple observation that in fact, the world ought to and can be studied 
from everywhere and anywhere. That has been my entry point. The world ought to be studied from everywhere and anywhere, partly because the planet is no longer as large as it once was. So if you want, that is, has been my starting point. But in fact, it is a starting point that has been there all along in, let's just call it black thought. In fact, that has been the claim, the most important claim that has been made all along. If we take seriously, let's say our own history, our own intellectual history. So let me just share with you a few uh, examples of how this question of the duty to study the world, this confrontation with the world, the duty to study it from everywhere and uh, anywhere, how it has been uh, let's say at the center of modern black uh, intellectual uh, project. We see it, for instance, in the work of Franz Fanon, who has been a, a, a major um, uh, interlocutor, uh, at least uh, uh, for me. Fanon, in fact, is one of the, uh, the few thinkers to have risked something that resembles a theory of decolonization. But a theory that is, uh, when we read him carefully, is at the same time, a hermeneutics, hermeneutics in the sense of who the self of this process is, a theory that is at the same time a hermeneutic and a pedagogy. A pedagogy in the sense of how and through what kind of praxis decolonization is to be achieved, for what aims, but particularly for what aims that could be described as universal, not regional, not particular, but universal. Today we would say planetary. So he's the, one of the few who comes close to that kind of, of theory. And uh, it strikes me that uh, his theory of decolonization rests almost entirely on a political theory of property and self-ownership. Why is this the case? This is the case for one simple reason. It is the case because of colonial racism which he understands as fundamentally a technology of dispossession. Now, the question is, what does he mean then by self-ownership? What does it mean to describe, define decolonization as a project of self-ownership? What does it mean to own oneself? It is nothing other than 
a step towards the creation of new forms of life that could be genuinely characterized as fully human. Because uh, for Fanon, to be was to create. To be was to be in relation. To create what? To create time, which he understood as the first historical event. The foundation, if you want, of any uh, subjectivity. So we have here a conception of being, which is quite peculiar, quite singular, because it's premises that being is not only constituted in time, but through, by means of, and almost by virtue of time. I could go on and on on this. It's a point we can pick up during the uh, conversation, but it seems to me important precisely to foreground it because behind the dispute over time and being, being in time, is the dispute over the uh, capacity for futurity, the disposition toward uh, the future. So that's Fanon. But you find the same preoccupation with the world at large in the work of someone who sometimes has been presented as the exact opposite of Fanon, someone like Senghor. Senghor is moved by the same preoccupation with world, worldliness, how to inhabit the world. You find the same preoccupation in the work of Edouard Glissant with his idea of le tout monde, the whole world. So thinking the world has been for me uh, the uh, best way, uh, the most the way I have found the most comfortable with of uh, engaging with these uh, broad global debate uh, that uh, today uh, uh, forces us to rethink uh, the whole decolonization uh, injunction. Let me end with a set of uh, further comments. I'll be brief and then I'll stop. And they have to do with something I really believe those of us trying to think the world from Africa must pay attention to is the emergence of new cognitive assemblages. In fact, as a result of technological innovations, and many other uh, factors, a certain number of epistemic reconfigurations or even shifts are underway in various disciplines and sub-disciplines. I think they are harnessed for the most part or they are harnessing new kinds of uh, data and they are reshaping what constitutes units of analysis. Wherever we look, we see new bodies of uh, thought uh, involved in rethinking the nature of knowledge itself, the nature of being and matter, of high degrees of agency are distributed across human and non-human agents. The point where it seems to me contrary to 
various discourses on the crisis of the humanities, the age is in fact characterized by heightened curiosity and accompanying experimentation. And I have tried to pay attention to the emergence of these entirely new cognitive assemblages, if not uh, uh, knowledge formations. Why are they emerging now? In what forms? That's something we can uh, deal with during the, uh, uh, the debate. But I just want to signal maybe two or three quick characteristics of uh, this novelty. First of all, the uh, renewed dialogue, which is unfolding between the social sciences, science and technology studies, environmental sciences, health sciences, the life and biological sciences, and philosophy. That renewed dialogue is in the making. It is not without uh, tensions or uh, contradictions, but part of what we are seeing is that issues that have primarily been the subject and object of the life and biological sciences are uh, in different ways, increasingly becoming the subject of theories and methods within the humanities and vice versa. Emergent fields that span the life and biological sciences and the humanities are engaged in a, a search for new terminologies new theoretical apparatuses, mostly at points of contact and interface across disciplinary boundaries and traditions to the point where <clears throat> humanities inflected inquiries are being reshaped in ways that make them more open to the biological sciences just at the time when the life and biological sciences for instance, are becoming more receptive to the social sciences. So what we're seeing is an incipient convergence, which itself has triggered the development of new research agendas. Agendas which overtly uh, privilege ideas of uh, co-constitution, <clears throat> co-evolution, co-implication, agendas that uh, emphasize the processual, indeterminate, contingent, nonlinear, and relational nature of phenomena constantly open to effects from contiguous processes. In other words, these are agendas that start from the assumption that there are no biological or vital processes that are not simultaneously technical, cultural, symbolic, material, economic, and immaterial. So that is going on. A number of other things are going on, but let me just say that the, this incipient convergence and a number of other factors is what has led me somewhat to not move away from the study of Africa, but to privilege increasingly the, uh, let's say, a, a different démarche, a different uh, approach which consists of trying to write Africa into the kinds of planetary debates 
we are forced to address uh, at this specific age uh, of, of the earth. Thus, uh, the latest works that I have produced, whether they have to do with concepts such as necropolitics, the latest work on brutalism, the forthcoming one on the earthly community, all striving to carve out some space for our deep archive in the context of the archive of the broader world, uh, Edouard Glissant uh, introduced us to. So those are some remarks, Sabelo, I wanted to share uh, with the audience. I'm sorry if I went a bit further than the 45 minutes you allocated to me. I spoke for uh, four minutes more and apologize for, for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Achil. And uh, no need to apologize, really. This was, uh, this was great. And uh, <clears throat> you touched all, on almost all the key issues uh, <clears throat> in, the, in the whole uh, big assignment of uh, <clears throat> rethinking Africa and the theorizing Africa. And I won't really try to summarize what you said. Perhaps I will spoil it. Uh, I will need to, to, to actually invite all of us to thank you so much and then move on to the, to the, to the next uh, <clears throat> segment of, uh, of, of the debate. Please join me in thanking Prof. Achil for this uh, <clears throat> opening of a wide canvas of issues on the, on the question of, of, uh, of Africa and African studies. Uh, I think uh, we could not get somebody else other than him to do this. Thank you so much, Achille. Uh, we're moving on to the next stage and I will hand over to Wongani Ngolunga. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sabelo. Thank you very much, uh, Achille, for this wonderful lecture. We have uh, four discussants. Um, I'll just introduce them briefly so that we can have time for questions. I mean, the first is Professor Emmanuel Achiampo, uh, who's uh, based at Harvard University. And the second is Professor Yolande Buke, who's uh, at Queen's University, but is currently at JAS as a writing fellow over there. And that is Professor Lonipa Mokwena, who's with uh, Professor Achiampo at VETS at Weiser. And finally, we have uh, Professor Febin Sa who's at Duke University. I think I should start with you, Professor Felwinsa, then we'll move in reverse. The, the, the next one will be Professor Mkwene. So each discussant will have about 10 minutes uh, and then we'll move to the next and then we'll have uh, questions and answers after that. Uh, to you, uh, Professor Sa. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you, Sabelo. And thank you for organizing this conversation with the work of Achille. And thank you, Achille, for the brilliant you know, presentation you gave us. So uh, I'm, uh, I was very interested in the beginning of your conversation that you set the stage by starting to discuss with Valentin Mutimbe ideas of the invention of Africa and the idea of the co-construction of the colonial library. And by asking us, if we have to decolonize this library, are we decolonizing a part of ourselves because we are part of this colonial library if we follow Valentine Mudimbe? And I was also very interested in your answer and the path you draw with the idea of a deep archive, the, the, the idea that the history of Africa is much more longer than that, that we have a deep history. And from this deep history, we have a deep archive. And if you want to reconstruct the, the, the symbolical identity or the epistemological identity of, of Africa or, or, the, or the theory, we have to bring back this deep archive. So probably one of the questions I want to ask you is how do you deal with the attempts to rebuild the, the long history of Africa by people like Sheikh Andre Job, Extra Extra? What is probably the difference that you feel 
in that attempt to reconstruct the long durée and, and this idea of building on a deep archive. I'm not sure it's, it's the same thing, but I will, you know, probably in your answer, I would love to hear you, you know, how, how, how do you deal with the Afrocentricity? More for example, that thing that we have to, you know, start from this point. The uh, second point I want to highlight uh, very quickly is that uh, I feel a big resonance uh, this talk with your work on Sortir de la Grande Nuit, on leaving the, the dark night and, and probably the end. Uh, Samuel sent us the, the, the epilogue, you know, a few, few days ago. And in the end of uh, leaving the dark night, uh, building on on Fano, you ask the question of the legacy of the decolonization, the legacy of the of the of the decolonization times. What remains actually from this experience? And you say that for France, Fano decolonized community defined itself by its relation to the future. So the question of how to build the future was important. So. I, my sense is that this question of defining Africa, redefining Africa, Africa in the theory is deeply linked with the question of, of how to build and to produce the future. And I don't see a difference between the, 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 the two attempts. And the question you are asking is by what mean, means of what knowledge will it be done and how do we restore life and new forms of life? And this question came again, you know, the question of creativity always building on Fano or, and, and building new, new form of life. And probably one of the questions I want to ask you is, uh, what is your opinion and, or, or, or what is your, your analysis and, and your diagnostic uh, on the failures that are our failures in this attempt to produce new forms of life? We haven't been able to produce new forms of political life New, new forms of economic life in a theoretical level, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we, we've been trapped in a in, in a passion of mimicry. And as if this interesting event called decolonization or taking over again in the sites of one's being, you know, has been totally failed. And why in your vision during this last century, African societies and nation, even if they are always sensitizing their archive and the global archive, but then they don't seem to have succeed to produce new forms of life in different domains. This is probably my second question. And I'll probably want to add some few comments to this question. And you know, they are at the same time some comments, at the same time proposition and, and question. And, uh, and I will build on this idea of, you know, of, uh, of uh, why do we need to put Africa in, in a theory to reinvent a concept, as, as Sabelo said, or the notion of Africa? Why this question of defining ourselves remains an important question? Does it mean that we are in we, we are always in the in the in the spheres or the stage or the place of uncertainty, uh, you know, a, a place where we didn't yet manage to have our two feet on the ground firmly? And why are we always on this question of who are we? And is it an existential crisis? Does it mean that uh, for now we haven't rebuilt our psychic infrastructure? And what this question means? So I would like to to hear your you. You know, a lot of the question around us is always around this idea of who are we, and and even if you know not allowing ourselves to use simply the concept of Africa, even if it's a complex one, but always trying to find a legitimacy to this idea. And if we look at Africans, they organically create Africa. They organically reinvent, reinvent themselves. They organically put sense and meanings in what being an African mean. But in a theoretical level and in the academy, this question is always here, you know, in the corner. 
and, and we are always trying to define what is organically a, a reality. So you, you just have to look at the African combination cup, cup in football or soccer, and you know that Africa exists. You know, <laughs> I know that it's not a, a very academic example, but what I want to say is that the organicity of the reality of African society and, and African identity in, in its plurality and complexity is an experiential reality, but in the space of academia, we are always, you know, dealing with this question. So, so I, I also want to come probably to know why, you know, for you, this kind of shakiness, you know, of, 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 of our identity. And, and I will we finish probably with the question of epistemology of knowledge. And I deeply think that obviously reinventing forms of life go with reinventing epistemologies or re sensitizing them and the two are linked so reinventing the way that we, we are dealing with economy ecology political or or just this idea that the shapes of forms of life are always unfinished shapes uh, you know obliges to think what are the you know the archive on which we build and how can we build what i call an ecology of knowledge to be able to to to, to synthesize all this knowledge and probably my proposition is is to go beyond the transdisciplinary dynamics that, that are actually going in the academy that you mentioned this renew dialogue of social science biological science from the philosophy and life science, and probably to integrate in that corpus of knowledge, way of knowings or forms of knowledge that are not from canonical knowledge th that are in the DNA of African societies. And probably that as we can't escape our deep archive and our complex archive, I think also that we can't escape the idea of reinvesting, restoring, knowledge that are, that are produced by our societies even if they are outside of the home canon of the of the universities and the academia and put them in this you know a kind of rebuilding of knowledge that necessitates you know to be able to rebuild or to reinvent uh, a form of life or to redraw them and the last idea and i will stop there you know before my 10 minutes is probably after um, my feeling is that we have to come continue the work of defascination and this work of defascination of forms of inhabiting the world of forms of life produced elsewhere. I think it's an ongoing work if you want to, to be able to reconstruct, you know, our knowledge, our epistemologies, to really reinvent ourselves and to produce deeply forms of life that are just not for Africans, but that can be, that can inspire, you know, a, a global human community that, that is seeking for a sense and a direction. So I will leave it here. And once again, I thank you very deeply for having invited me in this conversation with Ashley and all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fadwin, uh, for your comments. Uh, we'll move to so just one, actually, Lodor Repair is now translating in English and it will come shortly. Okay, okay, thanks. Thanks, Philwin. Yes. Um, hello, um, can I just start, Bongani? Please, please. Okay, um, thank you so much for um, this invitation um, into such a uh, prestigious company of people. I feel almost overwhelmed, um, but uh, I must say that uh, since Ashil is two doors down from my office, this is a bit of a comeuppance because a couple of weeks ago, we were supposed to be discussing his, his book, his essay collection with our PhD candidates and fellows, and Ashil got out of it. So now I'm doing the job that the PhD candidates should have done about two weeks ago um, in sort of offering some kind of critical remark on, or critical remarks on, 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 on this very beautiful collection, very challenging collection of essays, but also what he just presented this afternoon is Africa in theory. So 
I will try and limit my comments to three headings or three ideas that I think come out of this discussion that we're having this afternoon. And they are all inspired by, by Ashil's uh, recent collection of essays and, and, and the texts that, that, we, that we were given. The first one is this idea of Africa as a kind of site for humanity. And I will explain each one in my, in my comments. And then the second one is Africa as a site of the anti-human. And then the third one is Africa as a site of the Anthropocene. And then the third one is Africa as a site for the new or for novelty, if you want to use that term. So in the first instance, when we talk about African studies and Africa in theory and Africa as a site for humanity, um, Ashil sort of positions himself in this sort of debate that was partly initiated by the publication of Francis Fukuyama's book of the end of history and all these ideas about the end of history and how in that book, um, Fukuyama presents an idea of a kind of despair of the world that the, that the, the end of history will be a sad time and it will amount to nothing but the caretaking of the museum of human history. And this is what um, Ashil in some ways stages as, as the confrontation. So Africa as a site of this kind of museum of human history, if one can put it that way, and why it is that actually it is not a reason to despair in the way that we have been taught to despair by the end of history theorists. So in, in African studies, one can say that there's a contradiction between the idea that Africa is the kind of originator of humanity and the idea that Africa is a challenge to humanity's consciousness. So um, I think these tensions come out in some of the ideas that Ashil pre presents to us to, or presented to us this afternoon, but that are also in that essay. But what does this mean? Um, partly it means that these issues are often collapse into each other in the idea of Africa. Because on the one side, the Africa that people see visually is the Africa of giraffes and, and lions and beautiful sunsets and thorn bushes. And so there's something vaguely attractive about Africa. But Africans as people seem to somehow make people step backwards and say, oh no, there's something here that is not quite fully hum humanity. There's something that is challenging to my conscience about the way that Africans live or don't live. And so I think this tension, uh, Ashil has brought it out this afternoon as well. This, this how do we move beyond these kinds of um, uh, contradictory ideas? So if you all remember that famous essay, how to not write about Africa, um, this is what uh, was coming out, the ideas that were coming out that almost without thinking about it, people, when they write about Africa, they are caught between these two ideas of Africa as this great sort of um, furnace that created humanity. But then at the si same time, Africa as a kind of irreparable continent that either morally or, or, or uh, uh, philosophically has to somehow be patched together, a kind of band-aid understanding of Africa. So in contrast to this kind of depopulation of Africa through the failure of the project of humanity, Ashil Mbembe gives us a kind of multivocal and polyphonic idea of Africa, which I think is one of the kind of concluding remarks that he made this afternoon. But that still leaves us with a kind of challenge of how it is that this new uh, Africa, this Africa as a site for humanity can actually be initiated in theory. And this is where I'll leave that comment. So it's, it's really about how do we initiate a new kind of Africanist humanity? Um, uh, you know, Steve Biko called it giving Africa um, a, a fresh face, a new face, a, a more human face. So how do we how do we do that in actuality? Uh, so that's the first point that I want to make. And then the second point, which is related in some ways to the first, is the idea of Africa as a site of the anti-human. And here, Ashil, I think, is getting into the kind of sociology of the idea of Africa. Um, he quotes somewhere uh, Bruno Latour saying, we keep making the same gestures when everything else has changed around us. And I think this idea of Africa as the anti-human is exactly this kind of, it's almost like the, the, the stone in the shoe 
that keeps rubbing up against African studies, where it's like, okay, well, you tell us that we must write uh, uh, new theories about Africa, that we must look at the deep history of Africa, that we must take it seriously, the idea that Africa has a history, but why do we have this sort of recurring uh, return to colonial thought? Why do we have to return to this question of who Africans are as human beings? So the dehumanization of Africans is actually one of the core reasons for the production of decolonial thought and the very emergence of African studies as a kind of recuperative uh, set of disciplines. So African studies as a, as a palliative towards the idea that Africans are not really 100% fully, fully, fully human. So then if we are, as Africans, constantly being pushed back to this moment of this contest between colonial and decolonial thought, what then is the purpose of African studies if it's simply to keep, it's almost like a tennis match. You keep just watching which direction the ball swings. Is it swinging more towards colonial thought? Is it swinging more towards decolonial thought? And I think um, um, Ashil is trying to say that by accepting the boundaries set by colonial thought, as Africans, we have inadvertently accepted that Africans are the other, that Africans are strangers to the world, and that the role of theory and knowledge are to somehow reconcile Africans to a kind of estranged world. So this is, I don't know how many of you have seen this video that made the rounds on, on social media, where someone takes chocolate to an African child in Sudan, says, you know, chocolate is produced in Africa, but this child in Sudan has never tasted chocolate. Now that's an example of how, sort of presenting Africans as needing to be reconciled to some kind of estranged world, that Africans somehow have lost contact or touch with the, with the world. And that the, the purpose of, of African studies or the purpose of theory is to reconcile us to that world. And as I say, Ashil is sort of telling us that we have inadvertently accepted the idea that we are strangers to the world, which is what the archive of Africa actually shows that we are not. Um, and quite a lot of the times when I teach, my students often ask me exactly these questions. Like they say, they ask me very basic questions like, well, professor, if you say that this person traveled from South Africa to Zanzibar, how did they get there? And then I have to literally say to my students, they walked. How else do you think they got there? And so this is exactly what I mean by this kind of estrangement of, of Africans um, from the world. And then the third part is this idea of Africa as a site of the Anthropocene. Um, and this is a much more complicated idea because it is exactly about this biological and natural biodiversity of Africa, which has become a kind of burden um, since even the concept of environmentalism itself has been estranged from Africa. So it's almost as if as Africans, we are being told that the biodiversity around us doesn't even quite belong to us. And that we need to take someone else's ideas about how to reconcile ourselves to nature, how to live with nature, how to live with animals, how to live with plants, and how to become more African through that use. So I'm going to just put that there as one of the potential, because the, the whole topic of the Anthropocene is a much larger topic. But from my perspective, and for those of you who are interested, you can read Zamini's uh, um, 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 book on, on Safari Nation and how it is that it shows how the very creation of national parks in South Africa, the very creation of conservation, required the removal of Africans from nature and actually distancing them from nature by saying, well, they don't actually understand what environmentalism means. They don't understand what conservation means. So they cannot, they, they cannot be part of, 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 um, of nature. And this is what I, I call this kind of the site for the Anthropocene because the Anthropocene, the questions of Anthropocene force us to return to those questions about nature and Africa and Africans and, and conservation. And then the last point, um, before I run out of time, is what is in the epilogue. Okay, so we, we, have, ex we have deconstructed colonial thought. We have uh, reinvented African humanity. We have rejected the dehumanization of Africa. And we have accepted the, param the uh, parameters set by the new age of the Anthropocene. And now we have to create something new. We have as... Uh, um, uh, um, Falun Sal has pointed out, we have to do what um, Sheikh Anta Diop said we must do, which is to give back to the African people 
their Promethean consciousness. And so how do you, how do, you do that? So first and foremost, one of the problems is that very few people now read Greek thought. So first you have to start by explaining what a Promethean consciousness means. But before you can even do that, it's the idea that the, Africa, the African is a creator and the African can create their world and that Africa can be created anew several times over. And again here, I often am confronted when I present Sheikh Anta Diop as a kind of theorist of, 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 of novelty, of newness in Africa. People often say, but how do you do that? Everything has been destroyed. So again, there's an assumption that as Africans, we are like a phoenix rising out of the ashes, that somehow to be new requires you to, to reinvent and create something totally new, that you cannot be a new African from where you are, that somehow you have almost have to be, in the biblical sense, reborn as a new African. And I think that, again, is a reinvention of ideas that come from the deep archive, which Ashil um, uh, referred us to, where the concept of a new African has been debated and, and, and presented publicly so many times that actually, as Africans, we have so many options. It, it boggles the mind that we can even think about how to be new Africans. You know, in South Africa, you think about authors like H.I.E. Um, you think about the person that I've worked on, Makia Mafuzi, who were constantly saying, you need to think new thoughts, you need to think new ideas in order to, to, to surpass, to transcend the limits of colonial, colonial thought. But as even now in 2022, we are still returning to this question of what does a novel, what does a new Africa actually look like? And I think I'll stop there because uh, there are probably there are other discussants who have a lot to say, but I just wanted to present these four large points which I think come out of, of, of Ashil's discussion, but also to get back at Ashil for not discussing, for not discussing these issues with the students. And, uh, and I'm so pleased that we get to talk about them in, in this forum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sonipa, for those wonderful comments. Um, Professor Yolande Boka, uh, it's your turn. Good evening or good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank Sabelo and Mongani for inviting me to this inaugural conversation on theorizing Africa. Um, for the past few years, you know, some of these questions have been really on my mind. And I think if anyone who's um, been doing African studies broadly defined um, have been having some of these conversations either amongst their peers or along um, among the, with their students. I've been trying to open spaces with younger scholars um, based in Africa and in North America to discuss their views on kind of this, how to theorize anew or how to theorize from a perspective of, of decolonization. So um, thank you very much, Ashil, for this, this presentation and for your body of work. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm torn a little bit between addressing some of the comments that you've made today and then um, the, 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 the chapters that we were asked to read. But I think I want to make my remarks briefly because I'm also aware of time. Um, I want to make my remarks maybe focusing on, on three points or three or four points. Um, the first one is an interrogation of who's involved in the theorizing, and that I think goes along with what um, Dr. Sari and Dr. Mukwana, thank you so much for your remarks and your comments. I think they resonate a lot with my interrogations. Um, who's involved in the theorizing? Um, un unfortunately, um, you know, I, I spent some time uh, working in policy and then I returned to academia. The walls of the ivory tower are quite tall and slippery, and which makes it very difficult for us to critically engage with those who are outside of the academy. And for me, that's quite problematic because um, when we think about theorization, we often think about this level of thinking that has global applications, kind of this necessity of global application that can be um, re replicated, that can be can apply to different contexts and different spaces. Um, and in the process, um, at least particularly from the, the, the perspective of my discipline, which is international relations, we live out, we leave out the lived experiences of people we are actually speaking about. Um, and I find that quite challenging. 
So when we talk about um, how to theorize Africa, for me, I want us to really think deeply about who we involve in our conversation, uh, who we involved in our, in our exchanges, who's invited in the spaces we are created, we are creating and how we invite people into spaces where we want to think anew, theorize anew, what is Africa, but also what it is to be African. And I'm saying this from the perspective of somebody who is from West Africa, living in a diaspora, um, engaging with indigenous scholars in North America and trying to understand how they're reclaiming what it is to be indigenous in various parts of the world, but also coming as a West African and interrogating, how do you theorize Africa from the, when you're based in South Africa, that sometimes doesn't consider itself as a part of the continent, yeah? Um, so as I'm, I'm moving from place to place, I'm really thinking through um, the people that I involve in my conversations. And, and life itself is lived by people who are often rejected on the margins of the academy, of the margins of society that are not actually involved in this conversation. So what is the process of theorization if it does not take into consideration the lived experiences of individuals who are living in this place? Africa is not just a place. Africa is a place where people live, breathe, they mourn, they dance, they rejoice, they rejoice and they, they, they cry, yeah? So how do you engage in this exercise um, without really taking into consideration the people who live here? The second point that I want to make is one where I look at colonization, not only in terms of its material and political um, kinds of, of, of problems that it, it brings in, 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 as, we, as we look into the post-colony, but also looking at the structures of power that are related to gender. I think it is too often done when we are talking about theory, political theory, philosophy, this kind of bracketing of what are um, the ways in which gender relations were transformed, um, uh, I would say even violated, and what, are the what is the relationship with our understanding of race, gender and class, and how we want to theorize or theorize anew. I find it difficult actually to theorize anew if I don't take into consideration the work of African feminists, Black feminists more broadly into conversation. So when I talk, when we talk about Fanon and we talk about Glisson, I also want to talk about Pat McFadden. I also want to talk about Sylvia Winters. I want to talk about Sylvia Tamale, who speak to us very clearly about, you know, some of the realities of the African condition. So I actually am not ready to theorize anew until we've normalized engaging with this type of scholarship. Yeah, I, I find it quite challenging to do so. So this is for me kind of this, this this thing that I want to center in our conversation, um, if we do not make room for conceptualizing how transformation to gender relations are actually part and parcel of the colonial logics of you know, extraction and political and social organization in the post-colony, um, I don't think we actually are actually starting this conversation right. It has to be part of the conversation. And then um, there's, uh, you know, and I, I leave that, uh, you know, and I want us to think, of, think about this kind of relationship with gender and then this involvement in thinking what global blackness means. As we theorize Africa, there's, you know, there's been all this conversation about which Africa we're we talking about. We're talking about all of Africa, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, quote unquote. What is the role that black Africa plays in our theorization? And as somebody who's now doing a lot more work um, in, um, in uh, black studies and, global, and, and try to understanding global blackness, 
you know, I, this is also a part of the theorization that needs to be front and center. Um, and Africa, and, and if we go back to what I said at the beginning of my intervention, Africa is also who lives there. There are various groups of people who live on the continent. But the social and then political organizing of the place of Africa in the global world order um, are very, can very much be traced to this conceptualization of um, blackness and uh, blackness and um, white supremacy. I don't know if you guys can still hear me because um, I am, I see all of the faces are frozen at the moment. So I'm not sure if you can still hear me, but oh, I will continue you. as if, okay, I will continue as if you hear me. And um, lastly, because um, I have a lot of things to say, obviously, but um, uh, uh, Yolande, are you still there? I'm back. Uh, I'm back. <laughs> I also want us to um, to be as we are trying to reinvent. I actually want to put a plug um, for um, Puma and a a a a a ASAA had an entire conversation on uh, you know a year a year for the past year on on being human in Africa. And I want to encourage um, the audience um, to, to, to go and, and look at some of the conversations that have to, taken place in that space. So there's African scholars um, that are thinking really deeply about you know, what it is to be human on the continent, um, what is the relationship between individuals and the state in the post-colony um, from a variety of perspectives. And, um, and then there's also an interrogation of how long are we going, are going to continue to try to prove our humanity? How much time do we spend engaging in that conversation? Um, I think we need to interrogate uh, whether it, can, it serves us uh, as we are taking this kind of planetary approach to uh, theorizing anew, not only Africa, but our, our, our relationship with the planet, the planetary that maybe is, is, is talking about in, his, in the chapter that I read for today. Um, this, this continuous dichotomy between the human and non-human is also one of the reasons we are um, experiencing this environmental catastrophe, this sixth e extinction event that we are actually creating ourselves. So to what extent continuously trying to prove to um, white supremacy that black people are human, that Africans are human, actually um, uh, prevents us from, th from thinking critically about how we need to develop our relationship, redevelop or reclaim or re-excavate and re-elevate um, the types of relationship we had prior to the colonial encounter. Uh, and I will leave it at that, but it was uh, it's definitely uh, such a wonderful opportunity to be engaged with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yolande, for those comments. And our last discussant is Professor Emmanuel Achimpong. Uh, Emmanuel. Uh, let me also begin by thanking Sabello uh, and Bongani for the invitation. Uh, and also to thank my brother, Ashil. Uh, Ashil is always thought provoking. Uh, and as a social theorist, I have uh, valued him considerably, uh, especially in terms of how he conceptualizes and provides a window onto Africa's lived reality, how he connects that to global realities, especially unfolding processes that we are still trying to wrap our hands around. Uh, I only got the chapter uh, that we are supposed to read and comment on yesterday. Uh, so, uh, but I did read it. Uh, and, and actually I do own uh, Out of the Dark Night. Uh, and I had read other chapters in it, like the chapter on proximity uh, without reciprocity and Afropolitanism, but not the one on planetary entanglement, which I read uh, yesterday. As a historian, uh, my work is grounded in empiricism, and I step off that to theorize. Uh, historians are also storytellers, 
and we tell stories about continuity and change, uh, about structures and processes in societies. We try to discern patterns uh, and, and through that sort of help us understand about the past, the present, and perhaps how to build better futures. So I read with excitement uh, uh, Ashil's planetary entanglement. In this chapter, uh, Ashil is engaging, is a, is a critical engagement with Western social theory. Uh, its limits in helping us understand contemporary Africa and the need for what he calls a rethink of Africa. My colleagues at Harvard, Jean and John Komarov, in Theory from the South, which they published in 2011, argue that the South has become a vantage point to theorize about the world and the North, particularly regarding the fate of global capitalism and democratic movements. That the sharp insights about these processes today come not from the North, but the South. Ashil advances this argument in Planetary Entanglements, the chapter uh, we read. <clears throat> Critiquing a certain way of knowing about the world and Africa that privileges science and technology, market capitalism and humanitarian interventions, believing that these will solve most of Africa's problems. This, in my opinion, continues a praxis of knowledge that was born with empire and Western presumption that all societies could be reduced to and represented by a series of facts. And once that these facts were gathered and mastered, such societies then lend themselves to rule as Bernard Cohn documented in British rule in India. <clears throat> this praxis extended to Africa which Helen Tilly argues became a living laboratory in its subjection to scientific knowledge during colonial rule. This mindset prevails with development agencies and philanthropic organizations when it comes to Africa today, privileging what Ashil calls a technicist approach, which elevates quantitative approaches or data, i.e. facts over critical analysis. The limitation of these ways of knowing is that Africa remains an enigma, often stigmatized as unknowable, resistant to theory, which as Shil points out, has been how the West domesticates agency. I recall an incident in 2000 when Gavin Kitchen wrote an article about his decision to leave African studies because he found the field depressing, especially what was happening to African peoples. And I quote him, his inability to explain it adequately, let alone do anything about it. I am in agreement with Ashil, and I quote Ashil, that in fact, there is no better terrain than Africa for a scholarship that is keen to describe novelty and originality multiplicity, singularity, and complexity, and is mindful of the fact that the ways in which societies compose and invent themselves in the present, which we, would, we could call the creativity of practice, are always ahead of any knowledge we can produce about them. I end the quote. Not only is Africa important as a site for imaginative and creative scholarship, Perhaps there is no other region where the work or the, ta the task of theorization is perhaps more urgent. Gavin Kitchen quit African studies, a luxury we do not have, because African social realities did not lend themselves to theory. That is Western theory. The task of theory in the social sciences as Ashil notes, has been about deciphering one's own time and taking responsibility for one's own fate. For Africa, this task of deciphering is made more complex because of its planetary entanglement 
a process initiated by European colonialism, which was global and continues with the unfinished business of decolonization. Africa's planetary entanglement has assumed complex dimensions with the changing nature of industrial and financial capitalism and how it operates in the West and the non-West through racial subsidies. And with planetary challenges like global warming and its profound implications for Africa. In his epilogue, Ashil reflects on the political project of African nationalism, the making of community, and how it remains the project of the Africa to come. And here he draws on Fanon. This political project raises three questions, and I think these are important, and he states this in the epilogue. Who are we? And where are we in the present? Second, what do we want to become? And three, and what must we hope for the world? This African political project places emphasis on the work of theory and in the capacity of theory to elucidate existing structures of power. And as Ashil points out, to imagine alternative social arrangements. So this is my final thought and it comes with three sort of questions. Considering how Africa has long been denigrated in Western thought, should the West serve as a reference point when it comes to theorizing about Africa? Ashil ends his epilogue with the observation that, and I quote him, Africa will have to turn its gaze toward the new and that the future of our planet lies with Africa. If this is to materialize, Africa will have to look deep into itself to reimagine itself and a new future for the planet with Africa at its center. Itself a radical historical repositioning considering the continent's past history and its relations with the wider world, especially Euro-Africa. The Comoros theory from the South, written from the vantage point of the South, seemed unable to distance itself analytically from the North. One reviewer of the book, Christopher Alsobrook, noted that for most South Africans, the language of this theory is unfathomable. So my second question is this. There's a need to make theory accessible to Africans not just the erudite Africans, but to Africans broadly, since they are all part of the project of making community. How do we go about doing that? I agree with Ashil that to rethink Africa, there's a need to bring together history and philosophy. Western philosophy cannot be excluded from the endeavor. I accept that. But I would also like to see philosophy begin the task of restoring and instilling analytical vitality and rigor into African conceptual categories. Akin to the kind of work I've seen more recently in Uchena Okeje's book, Deliberative Agency, a study in modern African political philosophy. My colleagues, uh, uh, Felwin Honipa, referred to the work of Sheikh Anta Diop and others. How do we begin this process of instilling analytical vitality and rigor into African conceptual categories? And I'll value Ashil's thoughts in what, in how he as a philosopher can begin that process and what that endeavor would entail for him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel, for, for those comments. And um, we have about what, 20, 20 minutes or so uh, for, for comments, uh, questions, maybe to you, Sabelo, then. Hey, Bongani, can't we give a chill some, some time, time to, 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 to respond or to, to, to comment, respond. <laughs> not to give another presentation, of course. <laughs> I was worried about another presentation and thought I'll give him the last word. I mean, but he can, he can go ahead. <laughs> Please, Ashil. No, no, I mean, uh, um, 
I really have to express my uh, my deep gratitude to to Felwin, to um, Lunipa, my, my my neighbor <laughs> and colleague Yolanda, and and of course uh, Emmanuel, and uh, Ongani and and uh, Sabelo have I mean you you have crafted a, a very uh, beautiful offering. Listening to to them uh, was uh, uh, not only a pleasure for for the mind, but uh, a total provocation uh, for it. I took lots of notes. And, and as you said, I don't really want to give a, another presentation. I just want to highlight the, uh, the richness of uh, uh, the, their contributions, um, as well as uh, it's not a way of, of running away from the difficult questions they, they asked. Uh, 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 I might, if you allow me, com come back to, to them maybe uh, uh, at the end, because, because they are the core of the, uh, uh, the exchange we, we have had, uh, all of them, from what Yolanda uh, told us about um, the, let's see, the, um, the ways of um, uh, the, who, who is invested in theorizing, uh, who is invited to, to do it, uh, what do we do with the, uh, the multiplicity of the archives of ours, including that which come from a uh, uh, contribution of, of uh, feminist uh, scholarship to, to the last questions raised by, by Emmanuel, the ones uh, that were foregrounded by, by Felwin, uh, uh, and those uh, highlighted by by Lonipa. So, so should we agree that uh, I will have a little bit of time at the end to, to try to say one thing or two uh, in response to, to the colleagues? Okay, thanks. Thank you, thank you for that, um, Achille. Um, so any comments, questions? Um, we, we have about 20 minutes and we have to give Achille a little bit of time uh, to close uh, towards the end. Um, so you can raise your hand or speak. If you can check there also, sorry, no, if there are any questions. Um, I see we have a Fumni Adiwole, uh, please go ahead. And uh, followed by Ibrahim Asisma. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to Professor Mbembe and all the speakers. It's been amazing and thought provoking. Um, I don't know if this is a comment or a question, but um, within this conversation, there has been a discussion about why do we need to theorize Africa? Why do we need to define ourselves? Um, especially when in the day-to-day -day, people on, you know, in their day-to-day -day lives are continually <laughs> redefining themselves. And one of the respondents made that um, joke about football. If you go to a football match, you definitely know that Africans are in the now and defining their realities. Um, and I thought this was very thought provoking. What comes to me is that it's at the point of institutionalization. When we think about our institutions in Africa, we start defining what, it, what, what does it mean to be, to be African. Um, when um, growing up in Nigeria, and you know that your uh, governmental system, your civil service, your primary school education, your, ed, uh, your secondary school, your university, the frameworks for all these institutions came out of a Western system. And it's here that the argument of what it, how do we be contemporary Africans or present, it's in these spaces that we debate it. We do not, I do not see any such debate when I go to my village, Ileife, and sit out with my grandmothers and aunties, they don't debate it. Oh, the, the clay potter's broken, then take a iron bucket and go to the river. They, that doesn't destroy their sense of being African. It's when you go back to the university, uh, you carry an iron bucket and someone, say, someone says to you to be African, carry a clay pot. You know, that sort of, that's where the debate is. 
So the issue of philosophy here, I would say, really needs to enter that space of um, that space of how we understand our institutions and how we own them, um, how we own them, how we call them African today and stop thinking. I don't think any child growing up in Africa now will think a television is a European um, item. They will grow up seeing TVs, movies, um, mobile phones. They do not, that does not come out of their consciousness. So I think that's where these series and this debate is, is extremely useful. And I think it will help bridge those the, 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 that self-rejection that happens that we're working with these frameworks. So. Um, as I said, I don't know if this is a question or a comment, but um, um, yes, um, thank you <laughs> for the opportunity to, to, to express. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ibrahima. Oh, thank you very much. Um, this is a very interesting uh, topic and I have learned a lot from uh, those who have uh, spoken so far. Uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity to learn new things. Uh, my my what I would like to, 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 to focus on is about the issue of inclusion. When we're talking about all of these issues about how to, uh, how to understand Africa or how to, 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 to define Africa, it's also about issues related to inclusion. For example, when it comes to language policy in the continent, it's uh, really um, still not accepted by most of the time by the elite to consider that the language policies we have exclude the majority of our people in debate, such as the one we are carrying out now, almost 90% of Africans probably could not understand what we are saying. Yet we cannot do this kind of changes, the transformation that we are looking for in order to, 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 to make us go forward. And even the transformations which are needed in order to understand better the deafness of our history could not be done unless we tackle the issue of linguistic diversity, and oral traditions, indigenous knowledges. And I would like to ask uh, uh, Professor Bembe what he has to say about this issue. Linguistic diversity with regards to inclusion when it comes to talking about Africa and the future of Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prahima Roland. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Sabello, for organizing and uh, for involving us. Uh, thank you, Prof. Ashil, for uh, the, the the talk. I I got very interested in it as a student of Prof. Sabello and the colonial theories. I want to find out two things which I got probably lost uh, within the con context of the discussion, and the first one is uh, within the context of the. The, the deep archive, and uh, we are talking about the, the issues of uh, uh, decoloniality. Um, reading, reading the context of the, the deep archive, I am in the middle of a conference on slavery and um, the questions of the implications of the Africans themselves within the context of slavery and the, the returnees in Africa are coming up in this conference. So when we look at the deep, the, you know, the context of the deep archive and the issues of, uh, that uh, Mondimbe is raising, um, in terms of the position of decolonial theorists, uh, where do we situate this context of the, de the deep archive? Um, that is one of my questions. And the second question comes back to the new bodies of knowledge uh, that uh, Prof. Ashil is raising and um, the questions of why they are emerging now. And as a, a student of decolonial theory, I want to find out what we should watch out for. Uh, is it something that we are accepting in the context of uh, decoloniality or is it something that we should be careful about the context of um, the new bodies of knowledge that are emerging now? Uh, those are my, my questions. I, I would love to get some clarity. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, thank you, thank you, Roland. Uh, Lungile and Salas to be followed by Christine Evo William. 
Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Mulunga and uh, Prof. Sabelo for this occasion. And I also want to, to appreciate the presentation by Professor Achill. It was uh, very insightful. Uh, my question is around the question of interdisciplinarity in the sense that it seems to me that these kinds of discussions are very specialized and a bit distant from what is happening in other fields. What are the efforts that are being done to bring other disciplines into such uh, significant topics? Because I believe these should uh, permeate through uh, what is happening in economics, in accounting, in various other disciplines. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christine. Um, thank you, Professor Mbembe, uh, for yet another insightful uh, sort of mapping of the valuable uh, thought processes, which we definitely have to sort of keep at the fore front of our minds. I'd just like to sort of uh, also connect up to what Professor Buka and Professor Achimpong raised as well as regards the framework of knowledge production. On the one hand, the business of making theory accessible uh, to all Africans and not just those of the erudite persuasion. Uh, here then there was the mention of intellectual rigor. I would like to ask, um, according to whose standards of intellectual rigor is proper theory defined? And uh, how, how are theories then produced and by whom? Because the idea then of um, of demonstrating inclusion in making theory accessible to all Africans, there has that flavor of a certain top-down sort of, of, of direction um, uh, being in, in implied here. And connected to that, uh, speaking of the deep archive, um, I was just wondering about how the deep archive uh, is kind of embedded in the colonial library that you mentioned, um, and whether or not you see uh, overlaps between uh, a decolonial deep archive and an African studies deep archive, and um, the kinds of scholarship that are included in this deep archive. Um, does it also include uh, epistemic contributions from African women scholars. Professor Buka mentioned Patricia McFadden, Sylvia Tamale, Sylvia Winter as, as examples. I was struck in your talk while you were laying out these three sets of comments that you also cited from well-established um, men scholars. I was just wondering in your understanding of the deep archive, here as well in the context of producing proper theory as contribution to uh, uh, knowledge production in African studies. Where do you see African women scholars and their contributions uh, being uh, conducive to the type of work that you have just been propounding? Thank you so much. Once again, this has provided much food for thought and I'm learning again over and over. Thank, thank you, Christine. We have less than 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll take the last question from Minyarazi uh, Mshonga, uh, and then we'll give it back to you, uh, Ashidi, to, to respond. Thank, thanks, Chair. And uh, thank you very much, Professor Achille, and thank you very much, Professor uh, uh for, for for this wonderful you know engagement uh the first one is basically a question and then the last one a co uh, the first one is a comment and then the last one a, a, a question I, I think i like uh, professor actually members idea of uh, you know um which 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 he raised which which brings into question the issue of conversations 
uh, probably reciprocal and convivial uh, uh, conversations between uh, the disciplines and especially between what we may call uh, the STEM disciplines and the, and, and, and the non-STEM disciplines. Because I think if these two have some kind of reciprocal and convivial conversations, I think the world in which we live, I think we will understand it better in terms of, you know, um, uh, the real world in which we live, the material world in which we live, and, 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 and also the social world in which we live. So I really appreciate that. But the question that I have is, um, Prof, um, um, is Africa first decolonizing or is Africa first neoliberalizing? I, I, I ask this question precisely because of what is going on in the world today and especially especially what, what I think I have come across in your work and some of your presentations, what you call corporate dictatorship or, or governance, you know, by, by machines and, and the way in which the world is moving fast towards that. So I'm not sure whether we are in a mode in which we are really fast decolonizing or fast neoliberalizing. I would want some, some, some kind of clarification and some kind of explanation on, on, on what is taking place with a special reference to, 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 to Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Achil, uh, have a few minutes. Uh, so. Thanks, Bongani. <clears throat> As we, we can all see, um, this has been a, an extremely generous uh, uh, setting, uh, Bongani and, and Sabelo. Uh, and, um, a very generative uh, conversation. Uh, I, for once, will will go home tonight uh, with um, almost a, a new agenda um, to to recon with. Um, uh, Funi um, came back to one or two questions that were raised by by Felwin. Um, let, I'm not going to summarize it. The question was something like this. Why do we need to, to define who we are? Um, why is it not enough to uh, simply uh, take into account or start from the fact that we, we actually are? Uh, we actually are in the sense that we actually act. And uh, the way we act what we act upon should suffice to tell whoever is wondering who we are, who actually. Is. So um, uh, it seems to me that that's a very important uh, uh, question. How do we recognize that that facticity that indeed we are? And <laughs> can't you see? Uh, if you can't see her, can we help you to, to see? Um, but it seems to me that that's not enough. That we are, to say we are, we, we need to, to be able to interpret actively what it is that we are doing. That we need to, uh, to turn facts into three things turn facts into, into signs that require to be deciphered, turn facts into symbols, and turn facts into meaning. Especially at a time when the demand for meaning, for what Emmanuel called stories, is so crucial and in any case has always been a basic um, demand for humans. And as we understand now, for more than humans too. So that activity of deciphering, that activity of symbolizing, that activity of uh, giving meaning, it seems to me 
this is precisely what colonialism or colonial forms of thinking have targeted. Because that's where precisely life unfolds. And um, um, it seems to me that that's absolutely essential because that is also through those activities, the way in which we create memory and uh, write ourselves into a time that uh, goes well beyond the time of our own presence here on earth. This is uh, to me absolutely uh, essential because without that capacity to, to create memory, symbols, signs, and, and meaning, our capacity for futurity will be seriously uh, crippled. And uh, the pain of our history that has been inflicted upon us throughout history uh, will be sterile. Um, it won't be the departing point for opening up to potentialities. So, so uh, that's how I would, I would respond to, to this question. That's why too, in our recent history, by which I mean our history since decolonization, the 60s and of that, um, that's why uh, at least in the early years of decolonization, the discipline of history was so central to debates, intellectual debates in the continent. There were two disciplines that were, that were absolutely fundamental to African debates. The first one was history. And uh, I think it's Lonipa who mentioned Shekanta Diop. Uh, he wasn't alone. Teofilo Benga, Bubuhama. There were so many of them. And uh, the, in fact, the first work of decolonizing knowledge was undertaken precisely by those historians. We keep referring to the Fanon and the others, but the actual work of decolonizing knowledge came from historians, the first generation of African historians. History was key. In the 70s, philosophy came on board. But in what was rather, at least for me, a sterile debate, the debate on whether or not uh, there was something that could be called an African philosophy. An African philosophy will exist when you start philosophizing. It's as simple as that. But we wasted a lot of time asking the prejudicial question, does African philosophy exist? Of course it exists if you philosophize. The third domain was literature, where the act of decolonizing went on to. But as Felwin would agree, these are more or less canonical forms of knowledge production. But knowledge is not simply produced through these canonical dispositives. In fact, some of the best theoreticians in those years were musicians, composers, great artists. You go to the Congo, for instance, they haven't been a theorist as crucial to our self-understanding as Franco, for instance. One could give a long list of those theorists. They were preachers. So he's right that we have to expand the repertoire of knowledge production and knowledge dissemination. And that's how theory can be de democratized and its access uh, given to all. But there's work there that needs to be done, it seems to me, and it's absolutely uh, uh, important. Roland 
we come back to this question of the deep archive, it seems to me to be uh, incontournable, meaning in inevitable. It is inevitable, um, but I have to add to the necessity to return to the deep archive, the other necessity of thick description. And here responding, echoing uh, Emmanuel once again, when he talks about empiricism. I wouldn't say empiricism because the term has somewhat of a negative pejorative uh, inflection. I would argue that part of what we need now, especially today, is a return, some return to thick description. The kind of description only us can provide because of the uh, embodied experience of existence we are all uh, involved in. It always strikes me when I go to workshops or seminars in the continent. We have the formal setting where, of course, we quote Emmanuel, we quote Felwin, we quote Lonipa, uh, we quote uh, uh, Patricia McFadden, we, we quote Sylvia Tamale, uh, Aisha Imam, uh, Fatuso, we quote all of them. And then we go out of the uh, formal room, we have a drink. This is the moment I love the most because then speech is free and we start talking about our lived experience and the vocabulary becomes ever richer and the interpretation becomes ever dynamic. Why is it that there is such a gap between this way of thick describing our own experience and the paucity and the aridity and the superficiality of the academic form? That's a question we have to ask, which is part of the project of decolonization. So decolonizing knowledge will imply bridging the gap between the power of our speech when we talk about ourselves outside of formal settings and what are called the poverty of our language and our methods and our imagination when we have to uh, put it in the strictures of, 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 of uh, our disciplines. So that's one thing. The um, Lungili on interdisciplinarity, it's a very important question. Um, it is an important question because in fact, uh, what part of what is going on um, is not simply about interdisciplinarity. Part of what is going on is the advent of entirely new forms of, of knowledge and thinking. Let me just give the example of algorithmic thinking um, or various forms of automated reasoning. Part of what is going on is that reason as a faculty is less and less the monopoly of humans. It's becoming more and more shared with machines. And as a result, new debates are unfolding concerning all kinds of faculties. The faculty of knowing what desire uh, might be all, all about. What does it mean to judge? What is the meaning of truth? A truth produced by machines and a truth produced by, by humans. So with the end of uh, the human condition as marked by agency, because now we share agency with all other forces, geological forces, for instance, we are no longer the sole agents, which we believed before. And Western knowledge was premised precisely on that idea that we were the only ones to be endowed with reason, and we were the only ones to act and to be able to justify, account for our actions morally. That's finished, it's over. 
And all the knowledge was premised on that. If that is no longer the case, what does it stand for, knowledge? So those are the shifts I'm, I'm referring to. And we have to be able to intervene in those debates. We have to be able to intervene on them, in them, precisely because early on, we were denied reason, we were denied history. You know, you know the story. So the times, what I'm saying is that are propitious for a return to big questions, to deep history, big questions concerning in particular, the relation of human life to what I call planetary life. And in that sense, we have so much to contribute because if we look into our archive, the distinction between species, for instance, it was not something that was typical of our metaphysics. Just read I mean, the likes of Amos Tutuola. Amos Tutuola is the one I love quoting. He's probably our best theorist. Read Tutuola. Tutuola has responses to a whole set of the questions we are finding now in Anthropocene studies, in technology studies, the return of animism, all of that. But we have to interrogate him, recover him, and repurpose him with the new types of questions formulated from Africa, but with an impact that goes beyond the continent. That's the approach I think uh, uh, we, we probably need to, to take. Ibrahima uh, highlighted uh, for very good reasons the question of language. What we need is a linguistic debalkanization, if you want. What do I mean by linguistic debalkanization? It means I have to be able to read Sabelo in English or in Shona. And Sabelo has to be able, in addition to mastering English and Shona and other languages, to read me in French. Multilingualism. Where multilingualism doesn't apply, then we need to resort to what philosopher Suleyman Bashir Diaye has been talking about, about translation. We need to be able to engineer a new era of translation. Because right now, there are provinces, regions of knowledge we don't have access to because we only speak one language. That's what Africa is all about, multiplicity. So without the negotiation of the linguistic multiplicity of our continent, we are amputated, we amputate ourselves. So, so that's one thing in terms of the debalkanization of the kind of linguistic frontiers, which somewhat echo the physical territorial frontiers we, we are saddled with in our continent. I would go further than that to argue that we need to come back and reinterrogate the principle we agreed upon for probably good reasons. In 1963, when we edicted that borders inherited from colonialism were intangible. We have to reinterrogate the principle of the intangibility of colonial borders in a new African dispensation that would not simply be political, but which would be primarily intellectual. How do we break down the principle of intangibility in the domain of, of theorizing, of transmission, circulation, translation of knowledge 
denationalization of knowledge. That's how I would put uh, the issue. But I see Bongani and, and Sabelo uh, looking at me intently as if to tell me now you have to stop. Uh, as a consequence of which, I uh, don't well, want you to stop. <laughs> <laughs> as a consequence of which, I might not, as you see, be able to really go into some of the uh, more specific questions uh, that were raised by Yolanda Emmanuel and uh, uh, Lonipa and Felwin. But let me just end this really beautiful evening with two things as a way of bringing us back to where we started, this question of deep history, this question of uh, debalkanization, this question of thick description, all of them presuppose a departure from the self. They presuppose a deliberate opening up of the possibility in our work, the possibility of multiple passages and multiple crossings. Why? Because only the trial of passage and crossing allows us to not talk constantly either about ourselves, but about our responsibility at large to the world. Because Africa is not simply responsible for herself, Africa is also responsible for the whole world, or what uh, Glissant called the whole uh, le tout monde, indeed. And to be responsible for le tout monde, we need to learn to look together and see, but each time starting from multiple worlds. So look, I would like to end here. I think that's what all of us have been trying to do, each from a small angle. And I would like to really thank Bongani and Sabelo for having given us the opportunity tonight to put all of that together and, and, and share it. And my hope is that the next sessions uh, in the context of these absolutely fundamental seminar will allow us to continue uh, these, uh, this work all together. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Sabelo, let me give it to you. You started it to, to close. No, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prof. Ajil, for gracing this beautiful evening. It was indeed uh, a feast of ideas and indeed it took us to uh, back to the fundamental questions of deep history uh, <clears throat> uh, and the many other important questions. And indeed, this is the beginning. This was the opening seminar and they were going to have uh, a series of them every month. And some of the questions which we did not respond to today, perhaps we will respond to them in the next seminar. And uh, my brief now is really to thank you, uh, Prof. Chilmbembe, for this presentation and the leading and the opening this, this series. And I want to thank everyone for coming. And uh, again, apologize for not taking all the questions which were actually on the chat. I think next time we'll be able to take them. Thank you so much. Have a good night. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs>